Before we come to the Bible reading and the message for today, um, I just want to um, talk to you about prayer. Um, next Saturday morning, we're going to have the first of what I hope will be um, a regular quarterly prayer meeting. And it's for the whole church, so I'd like to really encourage you uh, to come along if you possibly can next Saturday morning. It's at 10 o'clock, uh, and it will finish probably around about quarter past, half past 11, something like that. And we're going to really pray together. Now, we're not just going to all sit together like this and different people pray. That might be a little bit of it, but there'll be lots of other ways that we're going to pray together as well. And the focus of that prayer is to pray for this, this church and the community in which the church is placed, and to be quite specific about that, and praying that God may bless and encourage and make our church healthy and strong and grow the church. Please come, if you possibly can. Ephesians 4, from verse 17 to Ephesians 5, verse 2. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as gentles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put, on, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be, made, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing might steal no more. He must work, doing something useful with his, with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, browing and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as Christ in God has forgiven you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ has loved us, and gave himself up for us, is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Thank you. So... <coughs> The Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter to the Ephesians, is longing to see these young churches begin to change. He wants to see them move away from the pagan, Gentile mindset and way of life that's all around them, and that is the background of most of them. And the message for them and would be for us today, is don't conform to society and its way of thought. And this is not a suggestion or an invitation. It's a command, Paul says. It's a command from an apostle 
someone authorised to speak for Christ. He insists <coughs> on it in the Lord. In other words, it isn't optional. Chameleons, and I, I came up with this picture of a chameleon, but actually, if you've got your bulletin, there's a much better chameleon that Clement has put on here, a lovely colourful chameleon on the front of there, make mine look rather dull. Um, but they, they're a type of lizard that adapt their appearance to match their surroundings in order to stay camouflaged and invisible to predators. And it's easy for us to live like spiritual chameleons, imitating the world around us in order to remain camouflaged and not be singled out as a Christian because we might get criticised or rejected or hurt. I remember in a job I had some time ago in a, in a factory, um, there was one man who I'd known for, it was only a short term job, I'd known for a little while, and um, one day we got talking and something I said, and he suddenly said to me, you're not one of those born again Christians, are you? And so I said, well, yes, I am actually. Um, <laughs> and he said, oh, he went like that. And he said, my parents are born again Christians. He gave him such a, a look and well, it didn't help our relationship, but you know, it had to, be, had to be said. I wonder, would someone who knows you well, maybe that you work with, be shocked to, dis to discover that you are a Christian? If so, then you could be a spiritual chameleon. And Paul's message from God would be stop copying the world and start imitating God. Because some Christians tend to com compartmentalize aspects of their lives. This is me on a Sunday in church, and this is me at home, and this is me at work or wherever. And for Paul, this begins with the way that we think. The Bible consistently teaches that our minds are not neutral. We've been naturally corrupted in our attitudes relating to God. And so godly behaviour must begin with a transformed mind. And this happens as God begins to speak through his word and cleanse and reorder our thinking, which then reshapes our attitudes and purifies and warms our heart in affection towards God. And that then redirects our wills and ultimately our behaviour in following Jesus. And unless we're regularly familiarising ourselves with God's word and meditating on it, then that won't happen in some kind of magical, romantic way. But as we do so, as the Holy Spirit illuminates the scriptures to us, Paul, Paul says we, we, we speak not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, express, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they're foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, for they are, they are spiritually discerned. <coughs> So we should think about what following and trusting in Jesus means in order to enable us to analyse life and its values. Our hearts are naturally deceived about what is truly desirable. Our hardness of hearts against God leads to darkness of understanding and darkness leads to ignorance of what is truly valuable and desirable in life and ignorance lays us open to all the deceits of, of the devil. Jesus says is the father of lies. He talks about the futility of their thinking. The futility of their thinking. 
And for some people, that might be about superstitious idolatry, revering a river or a cow, worshipping the sun, Stonehenge, or perhaps the bones of dead ancestors. Or it may be more subtle. So many things influence us. Our family, our background, our culture, our friends, the views and opinions of other people that we know well, television, social media, the prevailing pop view of popular culture. Do we even think through, from the perspective of someone who belongs to Christ, some of the views that we hold? some of the attitudes that we have, some of the behaviours and behaviour patterns and the things that we say. I'm often quite astonished how many people who are quite clearly um, Christians who love God will often say the words, oh my God, in a way that suggests that actually they don't really revere the name of God. Have you thought about that if you do that? The third commandment is you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Or that say, fingers crossed, which suggests that we're actually trusting in some kind of superstition or trying to kind of make sure we do something that placates the gods so that things go well. What kind of God does that suggest that we actually believe in? And perhaps we just never thought about that before. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to, to think, and it may be lots of other things, and perhaps things that I do as well, or say, I have to analyse that, but, but do we actually think through some of the things that we casually say, or say just because everybody else says them as well? The only way to change behaviour is by changing the state of our heart and our mind, which needs to be continually conscious of God. And we could say that these verses, these, these words that Paul writes in this passage, are the principle of changing your clothes. The phraseology may be outdated in what he says, but C.S. Lewis said that the purpose of the gospel is not to make us nice people, but new men. Well, new women, whatever it might be. This is not about character reformation, but it's about a radical change in which you become a brand new person altogether. Now that we are in Christ, as Paul writes frequently, we are in Christ, we have the responsibility in the power of the Spirit to take off the old lifestyle. Like someone taking off a shabby, worn suit of clothing. It may well have become comfortable you may have become used to it. You may quite like it. I'm a bit like that with my clothes sometimes. If I like them and they're comfortable, um, I'm reluctant to kind of part with them, change them. Familiar old clothes and new ones can seem a bit strange. But if you want to live as a new person and for the king, then the old set of clothes has to come off and the new set come on. And putting off the old person is more than just putting off old practices. Because Paul says in his letter to the Colossians that we take off the old self with its practices. The old person is the old bundle of attitudes and emotions and practices that I used to be, who I was before I was brought out of the darkness and encountered Jesus. You might think, well, that's a difficult thing to do. But the good news is that as a believer, you'll never have to live, try and live a, a more godly life without God. He doesn't sit up in heaven and just say, now you try and live like me. But he says, I have created in you a new nature, which is perfectly made in righteousness and holiness. Take off your old clothes and put on the new. 
A whole new order of reality has arrived, the dawn of a new age. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation is here. The old has gone. I'm no longer living in the realm of, of death and the dominion of sin, but I'm now in the life and reign of grace in my life. So how do we put on the new self, the new person? How do you think in such a way that God will be the creator of your thoughts? How do you feel in such a way that God will be the creator of your feelings? How do you act in such a way that God will be the creator of your actions? How do you put on the new person created by God? Well, the, the, the key is that Paul says, be made new in the attitude of your minds. That's the connection between the laying off of the old in verse 22 and the putting on of the new that he talks about in verse 24. Verse 22, the old person is corrupted by desires that are fueled and fired by deceit. The desires are deceitful because they promise satisfaction but in fact in prisoners. And the new person is created in righteousness and holiness that is fueled and fired by truth. Right attitudes and emotions and actions are born from true views of spiritual reality. So the bridge that leads from corrupting deceit to purifying truth is renewing the spirit of the mind. If your attitudes and emotions and practices come from the spirit of a renewed mind, they will be yours in one sense, but in a deeper sense, they'll be the creation of God in righteousness and holiness. And that happens as we allow ourselves to be directed by making our minds conscious of the spiritual and eternal and heavenly reality. Not just focusing on the things of here and now. Paul says we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day. We look not to the things that are seen, that are transient, but to the things that are unseen, which are eternal. <laughs> See, back in chapter 1, when we looked at that, Paul prays that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we might know the hope to which God has called us, the riches of his glory and glorious inheritance, and the immeasurable greatness of his power. He wants us to see things with the eyes of our hearts, which renews the spirit of the mind, allows it to be filled with God's power and God's promises. And then in chapter 3, when we were looking at chapter 3, Paul prays that we may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the fullness of the measure of God. Why? Because when your mind is filled with the love of Christ and the fullness of God, then the spirit of your mind is renewed and that brings about new attitudes and emotions and practices that clothe you with righteousness and holiness. And this new person that you become is the creation of God, meaning that he gets the glory for what's happening in your life. And so in terms of how this might play itself out, Paul focuses on three areas in particular, anger, stealing, and speech. And we probably all agree that stealing is wrong, and certain other forms of outward behavior. But what about our attitude towards anger and how we speak? Anger is not necessarily wrong. But anger that is righteous should replace anger that might control us. Two things characterise 
good or righteous anger. Firstly, it's based on God. It's based on God. James writes, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. In other words, we, we should be slow to anger because the anger that quickly arises is more likely to be mere human anger that does not accomplish God's righteousness. And if we're slow to anger and consider the matter carefully, then our anger, if it comes, might well be the anger of God. And the second thing that characterises good anger is that it's mingled with grief. The one instance where Jesus is actually said to get angry, and specifically says that in the scriptures, is when he's in the synagogue on a Sabbath about to heal a man's withered hand. And the Pharisees were adamantly opposed to this happening because it was the Sabbath. And we read that Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved or deeply distressed at their hardness of heart or stubborn hearts. It was God's anger, it was anger mixed with grief. So there is a time to get angry. But the time to stay angry is short. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. I'm not thinking that maybe if you're about to you get angry about 10 minutes before the sun happens to set, <laughs> you've got to get rid of it really quickly on that occasion. That's not what I think this is saying. What it's saying is get rid of it quickly. Don't let it linger and fester. Because anger, for all its possible legitimacy is a dangerous emotion and it can easily be nurtured into a grudge. Anger is the moral equivalent of biological adrenaline. You know, it's said to be good for our body and healthy to periodically experience adrenaline in reaction to dangerous situations or perhaps the situations where we're nervous. But a steady flow constantly will damage the heart. And so with anger, it's damaged many hearts because it was not put away, but nurtured again and again into a dis destroying grudge. In the same way, Paul, that Paul goes beyond not stealing and advocates generous giving and a completely new attitude to money and possessions, so he does the same also with how we speak. The Christian should really be a person who's trusted to say the right thing at the right time in the right way. It's Satan who wants to tear down people. And believers must not allow him to gain a foothold into our relationships with one another in the church. Because the more we allow alienation to fester, perhaps in anger, the more opportunity we give to the devil to twist our hearts, maybe to spread rumours, to stimulate self-justification and cause real division, damages the church. Rather we're to build others up, draw them near to Christ. I wonder, are you the kind of person that sometimes people just don't feel safe with because they wonder what you'll say next. The language of blessing needs to replace the language of cursing. This letter frequently stresses the need for unity and that's much more likely to come about if, as Paul says, we're actively promoting kindness. And maybe that can be about identifying your moods and behaviour patterns and seeing which ones might be going in the wrong direction and learn to consciously reject those behaviour patterns. If you just go with the flow of what you're feeling at the time, then that will certainly not happen. Some people think that just by going with the flow of what they're feeling, that they're being free, that they're being themselves. And I've heard and experienced too many 
Christians excuse their poor and sometimes unkind behaviour in church by saying, that's just who I am. As if that excuses it, as if that makes it acceptable in some way. It's as if they see just being who they are as somehow separate from their relationship with and growth in Christ. People who think they are free to be themselves, even if others get damaged in the process, are not actually free, but in bondage. It's going to be grow during testing rather than easy times. Perhaps we should regard our moods and the speech which sometimes comes from them as being like a strong and willful horse which needs to be firmly and frequently reminded which direction we're supposed to be going in as believers. And what's notable to me is that Paul doesn't just tell people not to be angry and not to steal, to watch their speech, but he provides pos positive alternative actions. People who are used to stealing have a duty to those in need and should work to make it possible. And bitter speech is not just to be avoided, but the tongue actually gives you an opportunity to bring God's grace to people by what you say and by how you say it, building up others. At Calvary, Christ gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God out of love. So to follow the example of Christ is not just with a cold, passionate absence um, of um, immorality, living that way, with a love that is willing to make sacrifices for others. This is fragrant to God. In other words, it pleases him. And our calling is not to be chameleons imitating the world, but Christians imitating God in the sacrificial love of his son. So let me ask you this morning as I come to a close in what I'm saying. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Are, are we claiming to be Christians but actually we're clothed in the fashions of the world. Like chameleons trying to stay camouflaged and avoid predators. Or are we being continually renewed in our minds by God through his word, putting on the holiness of Christ, marked by kindness, compassion, and sacrificial love? What do you need to take off as part of your clothing this morning? What do you need to put on? Let's pray.